I have changed my mind about the G9 autofocus so many times. Hey everybody, I'm Hugh Brownstone for Three Blind Men and an Elephant. Okay, I'm really, really late on my Panasonic G9 review series. Sorry. Uh, so late, in fact, that while today is about the G9's autofocus performance, we now have to address the whole shutter angle meme uh, for the GH5's autofocus, especially in video, identified by Yodio -Yo and now followed up by dozens, if not more, YouTubers, as in, does it work? And does it work for the G9? Let's cut to the chase. Because you definitely do not want to sit through the hours of footage I acquired across multiple locations in order to come up with the answers I'm about to give you. And I think you'll see that they're not quite the same as what other people have been posting. Well, certain similarities, I guess, of course. First, the G9 has outstanding stills. I'm going to repeat that stills as in photographic autofocus performance. I'd say functionally equivalent to or better than any camera I've ever owned, from DSLRs like the Canon 1D and the 5D Mark II, to mirrorless ILCs like the Sony A6000, A6300, and now the GH5, hold that thought, to any camera I've ever used, including Hasselblad's H6D, X1D, Sony's RX10s, RX100s, A99, A9, and A7R3, and previous models. I did not have the time, nor the inclination to stress test the G9 and the A7R3 side by side when I had them under the same roof, because attending a Villanova or Sixers basketball game just wasn't happening. I mean, to be honest, the last sports team I truly cared about was the 1973-1974 New York Knicks. I can say that for what I do, the G9's stills AF performance is about as good as it gets. So yay, awesome. Though I should go back to the Radnor hunt and see how it does with horses and a long lens. Second, even if it is positioned as a stills camera, the G9 is actually a slightly retuned and slightly decontented GH5. So anyone likely to buy it will clearly be interested in the G9's video performance as well. About which I can say, the G9's video autofocus is definitely better than the GH5. Except when it isn't. Real-world testing drove me batch crazy, and eventually I realized I was digging such a deep hole for myself with so many variables, including my own skill, experience, and patience, that I switched to an entirely different, more routinized, less real-world approach after I'd stepped away from all of this for a few weeks and still couldn't come to a definitive answer. Let me put it this way. With six different autofocus modes, a minimum of three different relevant frame rates, 11 different autofocus speed settings, seven different autofocus sensitivity settings, five different recording format settings, maybe 100 degrees of relevant shutter angle in the case of the GH5 and at least half a dozen, maybe a dozen or even two dozen relevant shutter speeds in the G9. And the choice of progressive or interlaced scanning, we are talking anywhere between tens of thousands and literally millions.
millions of combinations. Without a bent for engineering, a specific hypothesis to test, or the time and patience to tinker, I was already a fool when I decided to take a closer look. But, closer look I did take. So, third, there is an advantage to Yodio's shutter angle hack, and Gerald Undone's variation on it using 179 degrees for the shutter and specific speed and sensitivity settings for two very specific use cases. They really can make a difference to both cameras, even with the G9's inability to switch shutter angle or tune AF speed and sensitivity in video mode. As I said, after all, it is positioned as first and foremost a stills camera, although you can make those adjustments in stills mode. Moving to 1 80th of a second can help. But the improvements are not large enough, consistent enough to bet the ranch. And there are too many other variables beyond those I've already mentioned, including things like where you place the single area autofocus point, what particular lens you use, the amount of light and contrast in the scene, distance from the subject, the speed and direction and number of moving subjects, and the size, location, and movement of objects that obstruct the view. And that's just off the top of my head. Fourth, after trying too many scenarios to make any kind of economic sense, we'll cover that another time, I've concluded that the flagship Panasonic autofocus systems in the GH5, GH5S, hold that thought, and G9, do better when the camera is moving rather than when the subjects are moving. Fifth, if you want the most buttoned up video focus out there today, the most consistent anyway, go directly to Canon or Sony. Uh, I'm using this qualifier because even the A9 didn't nail 100% of the time. Best I've ever seen, but not 100%. And sometimes it just failed in the clutch. Sixth, if you want the most instinctive autofocus ever made, on the other hand, find uh, a copy of the 1998 era film camera Canon EOS 3 with eye control and ask Canon why they abandoned that technology. Seventh, if you want video autofocus so good, that you basically never need to think about it while filming and you won't notice it while viewing, which is after all what I want when I'm filming because there are too many other things to contend with when you're filming. Audio, lighting, on-screen talent, weather conditions, ambient lighting conditions. Well, forget about it. Even skilled focus pullers aren't spot on 100% of the time especially once you get extreme enough in your demands, which takes us to workarounds like manual focus, zone focus, limiting one's ambitions, none of which are bad ideas. Hold this thought. Eighth, as a complete aside, the blossoming number of shutter angle tests on YouTube and the variations YouTubers have explored are fascinating and tell me two things. It tells me that the YouTube community is, duh, an extraordinary resource even or especially for the manufacturers. Panasonic's engineers didn't find this. Enthusiasts did. It reminds me of what happened more than a century ago when different inventors claimed their proponents sometimes still claim on their behalf title of the first person to invent the motion picture camera. So credit where credit is due, which at this point, again, looks to me like Yodio, uh, with meaningful contributions by a number of other folks, including my friend Max Yuryev, 
uh, a person I have not met, I do not know, Gerald Undone, and Kai Wong, who pretty much everybody knows, whom I've also never met, uh, who, like me, attempted to make his testing repeatable by using a slider. Hang on. By the way, I can't tell if he's as frustrated as I am, but I don't think so, which uh, is good for him. Finally. After a year in the market with the GH5 and a month or two with the G9 and the GH5S, along with the arrival of the Fuji X-H1 and whatever Sony comes up with next, it's clear that significant improvements in video autofocus performance, both in terms of accuracy and consistency, and without the need to manually choose what works best, should be at the top of Panasonic's priority list. But I'm guessing it already is. This has been such a frustrating experience for me that I'm compelled to make a single overarching point. Whether you think of a camera merely as a tool or as the physical uh, and tactile embodiment of image making, having to constantly think about whether autofocus will work for you at any given moment, let alone tuning it for any given moment at that given moment, means it fails in either case. This is just not how I want to spend my time. I can't imagine that it's how you want to spend your time. To be fair, this is not just a Panasonic video autofocus uh, performance problem. It's actually an industry problem. Whether it's the Leica M8 needing an IR filter back in the day or Blackmagic needing to fix fine pattern noise a few years ago, um, contending with Canon's enormous crop factor and bloated codec in 4K, Sony's star-eating, feel free to pick your own uh, and share your favorite in the comments section below. We shouldn't have to spend our time and focus diddling with cameras to figure out how to make them work for basic functionality. Back in the analog film era, the only camera controls we had were focus, shutter speed, and aperture. Unless you actually had a built-in light meter, in which case then you'd have to flip it on or flip it off, maybe. And you'd have to set the ASA. It wasn't called ISO back then. You didn't have to be a programmer or beta tester. Yet these limitations didn't stop incredible photographers and filmmakers from making incredible photographs and films. I think it made it easier. The limits were clear. People worked within them like Cartier-Bresson with a Leica 3A, or Michael Curtis with a Mitchell BNC. Let's look at some footage. First, the GH5 as a baseline. This past summer, we took our GH5 inside the 1950s era US Navy hydrodynamic prototype submarine USS Albacore in dry dock. And with enough patience, we got some nicely cinematic AF, like this. Very smooth. So cool. Except when it wasn't. Folks were assisted in preparing, serving, and cleaning up after each meal by junior members of the crew referred as mess cooks. Better than I expected, actually, but definitely not reliable enough to count on. Unless I somehow figured out how to make it work. But I wasn't interested in taking the time. And I knew I wouldn't need it for my documentary work, which, after all, was the reason I bought the GH5 in the first place. A couple of months later, we took the G9 onto the High Line at dusk, and I got very excited with the image quality and face recognition capabilities of the G9 in low light. 
until they didn't work. Then again, to be fair, unlike the GH5S, the G9 is not rated to focus down to minus 5 EV. Another day, another opportunity. The G9 worked really well in video autofocus when Panasonic's Sean Robinson and I sat down to talk about the GH5S in a three camera shoot. All of that stuff has been kept, just improved in some of the areas where, you know, we, we, we took our lumps and this is what comes out of are. it. And here we are. Yeah. Well, I, I really was so struck by the improvement in image quality in video. Yeah. Really, it's, it's fascinating because 10 megapixels really takes it out of the running for a high-end stills camera. Although, as we've discussed before, <laughs> you know, a 12 megapixel iPhone is good enough to have a billboard covering two of the yeah. tunnels, you know, above two of the tunnels of the Lincoln Tunnel. Oh, yeah. Uh, because, as we've said so many times, it's not just resolution, it's also display size, display distance, yeah. and then how you choose to sharpen. Yeah. Because what you see up close and looks horrible sharpened from 100 yards away looks fantastic. I would argue that I would pick it up first of mind in certain situations. You know, sure. if I'm shooting a band, I would much rather take this because I know low light's going to be a challenge. I would much rather be able to shoot at that higher ISO. And you know and you're I not going to put it up. And I can sacrifice resolution in that Yeah, case. because you know you're not putting it up over the Lincoln Tunnel. Yeah. yeah. Well, even if I was putting it over the Lincoln Tunnel, I probably don't have to worry about what anyone thinks about what camera I shoot with. So <laughs> Yeah, at that point, you know, take a hike. Shooting a concert, yeah, you're, you're dang right <laughs> I shot it on that. The G9 with Olympus 75mm f1.8 never lost focus on me. But then again... I didn't move very much. The camera didn't move at all. And I lit the set to be very high contrast. All factors working in the G9's favor. Yet another day, another opportunity. We took the G9 to Nicholas Smith Trains and Toys in Broomall, Pennsylvania, fixated by the idea of getting a repeatable tracking test. Epic fail. I could not repeat results, though most often the autofocus didn't work the way I wanted it to, even when the system said it was tracking. But it didn't work consistently on the Sony A6300 either. Yeah, that didn't work at all. Okay. On the other hand, just swinging cameras from trains on the track to cars on the shelves to little men and trees on a wall displayed one next to the other, the Sony was noticeably faster and sure, if not exactly smooth, with the G9 a clear second, 12 to 60, around 40 millimeter. So let's come around over here. Let's come around over here. Let's come around over here. And the GH5 pre-hack basically giving up the ghost. So here's the GH5 with the uh, 12 to 60. Wow, that's really not going. Holy smokes. That's useless. If you add in the iPhone with its inherent deep depth of field and darned good phase detection autofocus, it came in first. That's a 2X. The folks at Nicholas Smith Trains and Toys were kind to let us test there. And it is an amazing place, but if I couldn't make tracking autofocus work at Roadside America back during the summer, I'm not really sure why I thought I could get it to work here. Again, too many variables to control, plus too many on-off switches on too many pieces of kit, even as I left the most important pieces of kit, other than the cameras and lenses themselves, 
like a Ninja or Blackmagic Video Assist 4K so I could show you the actual screens and precisely what was happening on these cameras as they were happening, which just proves once again that wetware is more important than hardware or software. On the other hand, it seemed pretty clear that the G9 was significantly better than the GH5 in 225 point area and single area autofocus. The G9 surprised me when its face recognition worked really well during my testing of wireless labs. I really didn't expect it to hold focus like that. So this is the Panasonic G9 actually with the Leica 12 to 60 millimeter set at f2.8 and uh, I've got three labs on my chest. No dead cats, so if there's any issue, then okay. Yay, I wouldn't need the A6300 for gimbal work if the G9 was the only option available to me. At least, not in bright daylight, held a fairly consistent distance from my face. We used a combination of a locked down GH5 and a monopod mounted G9 while filming a town meeting for our documentary series, Mariner East. We are not um, able to discuss that because this is not a formal meeting at this time. No, you can. Oh, you can Actually, um, I'm sorry, point of order, Mr. Chairman. To make a formal meeting, and it, uh, the meeting was called to order, Therefore, this meeting, even though it cannot go forward, is still, until adjourned, a technical formal meeting. So every comment and every statement that's being made is on the record right now. That is a fact. So until this is adjourned, I would highly recommend, for your sake, that you answer these people's questions so that you guys don't start off on the wrong foot. The G9, again, worked better than I expected, though it wasn't perfect. But there was little to separate the G9 from the GH5 or GH5S when Max Yuryev, Sean Robinson, and I went onto the streets of New York City in the bitter cold to test them side by side. We are working together to give you a tracking autofocus test with the GH5S, GH5, and G9. We're using the 12 to 60 at 35 millimeters and the 12 to 38, 12 to 35 at uh, 35 millimeter, both set to F4. <laughs> it's really cold. Max, look what you've reduced me to. Playing whack-a-mole with autofocus. The G9 worked pretty darn well when I went back to our local farmer's market Location of our testing with the Sony A99 Mark II. Not perfect, but pretty good. Then again, I'd never actually shoot like this in the real world. Now, as I alluded to earlier, in order to create a repeatable routine and control as many variables as possible because real world wasn't helping me that much. In other words, to eliminate the likelihood of a placebo effect or confirmation bias, I set up a Syrup Genie motion control unit on top of one of their sliders, and then stuck my Braun Niso S56 Super 8 camera on top to serve as the subject to be tracked. This is what it looked like the first time I tried it, back before the hack on January 14th.
If you see the same thing I do, you see that there's little to distinguish the G9 from the GH5. Neither is brilliant and consistent at what should be a very simple task, while the Sony definitely does better. On the other hand, you may also notice that I gave up on using an external recorder with the A6300, which, who knows, may have affected the outcome. I didn't use it because the atrocious micro HDMI port refused to cooperate. Another aside, this is not an inconsequential fact. That micro HDMI port is a primary reason I much prefer the G9 and GH5 with their full-sized, more reliable, more consistent HDMI ports. The larger point is that when we buy cameras, we're buying a package of trade-offs and it pays to be clear about what trade-offs we're each willing to make. After I watched Yodi Yo and Gerald Undone, I went back to the syrup test. Even in 24P, the combination of Gerald Undone's speed and sensitivity settings, coupled with the variation to Yodi Yo's change of angle of just one degree on the GH5, made a noticeable difference. But I can tell you that over a number of runs, it wasn't consistent. This is probably because I'm not well suited to go through every combination and tease out the dependent and independent variables of each sample. While I couldn't double check Gerald Dundon's full variant of Yodio's shutter hack by setting speed and sensitivity for video autofocus, again, you can't do that on the G9, face recognition worked better on the G9 with shutter speed set to 1 80th than it did on the GH5 with the mod and hack. So I haven't shaven yet this morning. I have a bit of a headache, but I quickly wanted to see if the combination of face recognition and a G9 version of the shutter angle hack worked here. In this case, all I've done is I've changed the shutter speed to 1 80th instead of my normal 1 50th of a second because the G9, positioned as it is, as a stills camera, does not have synchro scan. It does not have the ability to switch between shutter angle and shutter speed. But at the end of the day, that really shouldn't matter, should it? Well, to the extent that it matters for speed and sensitivity settings, okay, you can't do that on the G9 in video. You can do it for stills. And uh, maybe this works. I can tell you that right now I'm running remote app and the uh, Atomos Ninja at the same time. So that's a cool thing. Let's see what it looks like. So now I'm using the GH5 with the Yo to Yo hack, along with Gerald Undone's tuning of the sensitivity and speed. Minus two on the speed, minus one on the sensitivity. And let's see how it works now. The one thing that I would be looking for in particular is flutter in the background because on the G9, that's not something that we can control. And I saw it, let's see what it looks like. While you can see that the face recognition worked reasonably well, you can also see that the background will flutter, which is annoying and not something that you want. 
please do watch Yodio, -Yo, Gerald Undone, and Max Yuriev's videos. Give them a thumbs up. Subscribe if you'd like. They, they do good work. And I'll provide links down below and maybe up here somewhere. It's not like these hacks suddenly make either camera's video autofocus epic, nor that these solutions can be applied uniformly to all scenarios. Not, not at all. But they do help. What I'd really like is for the deep learning in Panasonic's flagship models, heck, all of them, to get a little vitamin boost somehow. The software ought to be able to discern what the scene is and select the appropriate system settings, not just autofocus settings. This is the promise of deep learning after all, and in a different way, for example, Arsenal that intelligent assistant for photographers, which uh, was able to gain more than $3 million of support on Kickstarter. So what do you do with this information? What do I do with this information? Well, I'm really happy with the G9's stills autofocus, but I'm going to wait for the firmware update from Panasonic, if it comes, for improved video AF. In the meantime, I'll continue to live without autofocus for video or rely on, for now, the A6300 and concentrate on other things. On the other hand, some of you might argue that this less than stellar video autofocus, even with the hacks, is enough to make the new Fuji X-H1 a compelling alternative or maybe even something like the Canon T7i for which you'd be willing to accept 1080p in exchange for dual pixel AF, a larger APS-C sensor, a flippy screen, and a less than half the price, $749. And you might be right. Maybe. The X-H1 does have better phase detect autofocus, which is purportedly better than the phase detect autofocus in the X-T2, which I know was already better than the GH5, while having similar to the G9 30 minute recording limit, 8 bit limit, brilliant EVF, in body image stabilization, finally, although I doubt it's as good as the G9s, and a small, beautiful crop sensor coverage prime set, along with a touch user interface, which I suspect significantly narrows the advantage in this area, the Panasonics have enjoyed over, say, the Sony's. The X-H1 body will cost you a cool 500 more than the G9 because you'll need the battery grip to achieve that recording time limit and get a headphone jack, though you still won't have a twisty rear LCD or 240 frames per second in full HD. Meanwhile, for the next couple of days anyway, you can pick up a GH5 on sale at B&H, Amazon, and Adorama for $400 less than the X-H1 and still get unlimited recording, a headphone jack, 10 bit 422 internal recording, and 180 frames per second in full HD. But I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself. More on this in our next episode. So, look, that's it for now. One more thing this episode was shot on the G9, single area autofocus, 180th of a second at 4K, 24 frames per second instead of the usual 150th using the Sigma 30 millimeter F1.4 set to about F2.5. Maybe I can use uh, the G9's autofocus reliably for interviews now. If you like what you've seen here today, please give a thumbs up, subscribe, join the conversation below. Always a blast. You guys are amazing. Share, add to a playlist. Consider supporting our work by using our no cost to you affiliate links or even making a direct contribution via the PayPal link, both in the show more section below this video. We thank you for it. For Three Blind Men and an Elephant, I'm Hugh Brownstone. See you next time.